There is a bit of a trick to preparing a monster hunt that's fun for the party and doesn't accidentally turn out to be little more than a boring fetch quest, but it's not that hard and I'm going to teach you how to do it today. My name is Ben Byrne and this is how to hunt monsters in D&D 5e. able to create engaging monster hunts, first, it's good to know why hunting monsters is fun. Partially, it's because there's often combat involved, and D&D 5e is largely a game about fighting things. But you know what's not fun? A fetch quest, where the local farmer asks the party to bring back eight dire wolf pelts to prove that they've thinned out the local pack, or that the party must go out and rescue someone who's been kidnapped by an ogre or a troll. You know what? is fun is a mystery. As often as you can, you should start your monster hunts with some form of mystery without explaining to the party exactly what the monster even is. Mysteries pique our curiosity and lure us into a story by motivating us to discover the truth. A mystery is a challenge and being capable of solving mysteries is as strong a power fantasy as demolishing a hundred orcs in combat. Monster hunts that start with a mystery are such engaging quests for players to undertake because the unknown pulls the party in and the payoff is the satisfaction of solving the mystery and defeating the monster at the heart of it. Mysterious events caused by monsters have also been common in mythology, fairy tales, and folklore since stories were first being told. Monsters like vampires, werewolves, witches, and fairies were assumed to be the cause of all manner of unexplainable ailments and bad luck. Dragons and giants were used to explain the event of a thunderstorm or the presence of a volcano. While in the real world today, we now have scientific explanations for each of these occurrences, the fun of role playing in a fantasy world is that these mysteries can have supernatural explanations. The plague that's ravaging a village is caused by a pester that can be defeated, or the child that went missing can be recovered once you discover that a fey queen is behind the kidnapping. We've spoken on this channel before about how building a mystery around a monster can also make them seem more formidable and frightening, which is maybe why monster hunting is such a staple in dark fantasy. So let's Let's break the monster hunt into four phases, which you can use to quickly plan one for your next D&D session. First, you'll probably start by deciding what monster it is you want your players to hunt, and that will inform a lot of how you prepare not just the setup, but also the investigation and then the confrontation. The players will become informed about the quest during the setup, possibly by finding it on a bounty board. But to be honest with you, I find it's far more engaging if an actual NPC comes to the heroes seeking their aid rather than telling the heroes there's a bounty board they can look to for quests. It's just, that's overly passive and players don't engage with it a lot in my experience. In this example, I'm going to have my players hunting a Muklark, which are creatures of my own design that I talked about in this video here, where you can find its stat block and everything you need to know to run a Muklark as well. These Muklark have been hanging out in a local cemetery. The cemetery is blanketed in a thick fog which spills over its low cobblestone walls, and a local who lives nearby has heard shouts and screams from the cemetery a few nights back. At this stage, your players won't know what the monster is and might be assuming that the cemetery is haunted. The quest giver believes that the cemetery is haunted themselves and so has told the party as such. NPCs are not monster experts and their superstitions may in fact provide the wrong information to the party. And this can help you as the GM set up your monster hunt as a mystery because the NPCs are providing inaccurate help. This also helps you stop your monster hunts from being predictable because you can then surprise your players and surprises 
are fun. What at first may seem like a ghost haunting turns out to be a pack of muklak. Or your players might have thought that they were hunting a fiery elemental but are actually stumbling into a dragon's lair. Your setup should be like presenting the symptoms of an illness to your players, describing what the trouble your monster is causing rather than what the monster is itself. Then your players must diagnose the problem via the investigation slash exploration phase. This is where some of my advice goes out to the players specifically, and it's that you should intentionally investigate the monster before you aim to confront it. I've run more than a few monster hunts where the party were almost wiped out in a TPK due to rushing into a fight without investigating what the monster is. So players, please take the time to gather the clues that will help you in your hunting. And GMs, make sure to sprinkle clues to the monster's identity and how to fight it throughout the quest. Investigating for clues could include interviewing eyewitnesses, examining the corpse of a victim, or exploring the monster's lair. Let's go back to our example with the Mukluk who have their lair in the cemetery. The players discover that there are claw marks on the old gravestones with a DC 14 perception check. They also determine that the heavy fog is supernatural with a DC 14 nature or arcana check, and therefore the fog is likely caused by the monster itself. However, the party also realise with a DC 15 investigation check that none of the graves have been disturbed, so it's unlikely that zombies or ghouls have risen up out of them or dug down into them to get to the remains. And ghosts or wraiths don't leave claw marks in stone. So are the monsters even undead at all? Each time your players discover a clue, it should help inform them as to the monster's identity, but also how to combat it, what the monster's weaknesses are. If there are claw marks in stone, it is likely that the monster attacks physically and that a high armor class will be beneficial. If the party learn that the monster isn't undead, they'll know not to waste actions on abilities like turn undead. The Mooklark and each monster in the Grim Hollow Monster Grimoire all have lore associated with them that can help GMs create these clues. For each clue discovered, the DC for guessing the monster's identity drops by two. You can decide the ability check and DC required to guess a monster's identity based on what creature type they are and how common or rare that creature is in your campaign world. Then the DC could be lowered for every accurate clue that your party discovers. Accurate being the optimum word there, as remember, some NPCs can give inaccurate information, but the players might believe it's accurate at the time. Your players may even be able to guess the monster's identity without needing to make an ability check, and that's part of the fun. Were the players themselves clever enough to figure out the mystery of the monster's identity just by playing the game? A well-conceived monster hunt has a climactic confrontation with the troublesome creature that is easier when the characters have investigated and are well prepared for the fight, but will be a lot harder if the players haven't gathered clues during the investigation or the exploration phase. This is what makes for a satisfying conclusion to a monster hunt, feeling rewarded for the preparation you did before the confrontation and now being able to exploit the monster monster's weaknesses as you fight it. Your monster may have a Death Star exhaust port that your players can target, a specific weakness that makes the fight a lot easier. This could be a damage vulnerability, such as thunder damage against an earth elemental. But to keep combat challenging in 5e, it's more likely that monsters will have strengths that make fights much harder unless those strengths are overcome. So for example, lycanthropes and trolls don't have vulnerability to silver silver or fire damage respectively, but without those tools at their disposal, players are going to have a lot harder time fighting a lycanthrope without silver or a troll without fire. The difference in combat could simply be made by knowing that a monster like the Mooklak only attack with their claws and are much less dangerous at range. Therefore, the party may try to lure the Mooklak out of the tight confines of the graveyard's barrow, where the spellcasters and the archers in the party can get further 
further than 10 feet back from them. Your characters could discover that Mukluk love eating flesh and bone and could be lured out of the barrow with a sufficiently sized animal carcass. But failing to put such a plan into action and running into the barrow to fight the Mukluk on their terms will make the fight much more dangerous because the Mukluk can teleport around inside of the mist. You can provide lair actions to a lone monster to make fighting it in its lair more dangerous or minions that the party have to learn exist or else risk becoming overwhelmed in the final confrontation. And of course, you needn't even fight the monster if you learn that it can be reasoned with and gain some leverage during the investigation or exploration phase. This could be the case with the child snatching Fey Queen or even offering treasures to a dragon to avoid a particularly deadly encounter. The final phase of a monster hunt is rewarding your players for slaying, banishing, or successfully negotiating with a monster and therefore solving the common folk's problem. Such rewards could take the guise of a gold payment, treasure found in the monster's lair, or salvage taken from the monster's remains that could be crafted into a magic item. In the Mukluk quest, the players can gain all three of these different rewards, getting payment for slaying the Mukluk, discovering equipment from past adventurers that were slain in the Mukluk's lair and salvaging the monster's lungs to create an ever-smoking bottle. The reward could also be a piece of information that was required to progress the main campaign or rescue an NPC that becomes a permanent party ally. Monster hunts presented in the way that I've described so far in this video sound very side questy, like something the players might opt into by plucking a bounty from the bounty Board. However, players will be most invested in your monster hunt if you can embed it into the main campaign somehow or make its story more than just slaying a troublesome pest. In the case of the Mukla quest, a living NPC has barricaded themselves inside the barrow to escape the monster's claws. But now they are in need of rescue. This NPC could be someone the party were already looking for and is important to the main campaign, the party tracking them to the graveyard which kicks off the quest to hunt the Mooklark. Maybe there's an important artifact hidden inside a monster's lair, or the monster themselves are a main character in your campaign, such as a nobleman nobody realises is a vampire until after you start investigating. Monster hunts also don't need to be black and white. The party could discover during investigation that the kidnapped child is actually half Fae themselves and the daughter of the Fae Queen. The child wished to live with their mother in the Fey realm, and the noble father who initially set the party on the quest is threatening to burn the forest and every living thing inside if the child is not returned. Maybe the party can gain a reward from the Fey Queen instead, and the man becomes the monster of this particular story. If you're still feeling unsure about designing your own monster hunts, uh, you could pick up these Grim Hollow bounty cards, which are actually written by myself and my wife, Tori. We wrote this deck of 50 bounties for the monster grimoire, and and I'll throw a link up here if you want to check the deck out. You do need a copy of the Monster Grimoire to run these, but as you can see, they have a mystery presented to the players in the guise of a bounty on one side, and on the reverse side is all the information the GM needs to run the quest once it's been chosen. These can be run straight out of the box or you can practice building upon them to incorporate a monster hunt into the main story of your campaign. If you enjoyed this video, if you found it useful, we'd really appreciate if you liked and considered subscribing to the channel. We're back every week with more advice and even handouts like stat blocks for you to use in your D&D campaign, such as this video up here where we have four new Grim Hollow monsters that you can deploy in your own monster hunts, or if you want to be a monster hunter, check out this video here for information about the class that we wrote.